uh, Mr. Noor and uh, Madame for uh, having me here once again. This is the second time I'm here and the last time I also spoke on uh, regional uh, diplomacy, specifically the ASEAN. Uh, but uh, this time I was asked to talk about uh, regional diplomacy uh, in general. Now, um, again, I'll be talking about ASEAN because I guess that's uh, uh, not only uh, one of my main experiences in the Foreign Service, but it's also one of the more uh, well-known regional organizations around the world. Um, we know very well that now we have a lot of regional organizations, SCO, SARC, we have Mercosur in Latin America, and of course the most famous of them, the European Union. You also have the Organization of American States. Actually, since 1995 and the Maastricht Treaty in uh, Europe, there have been a proliferation of so many regional organizations and free trade areas. So much so that uh, uh, we used to call them alphabet soup because you have a lot of those letters. ASEAN, SEO, <laughs> SAARC, uh, all those things, even the Eurasian Union for Central Asia and uh, uh, Russia. So um, uh, uh, they suddenly uh, proliferated uh, in the middle of the 1990s. And then uh, by uh, the year 2000, there were so many of them. And not only were there so many of them, they were so interrelated. They were all cooperating with, with each other in uh, bigger organizations that uh, aside from calling them alphabet soup, we started calling them the spaghetti bowl of uh, RTAs and FTAs. Now, I'm saying this because um, I've been in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs for uh, 25 years now. And in um, the course of my work, uh, I have worked for at least two regional organizations. The last one before I came here was the ASEAN, and that's what I'm going to talk about. I was the one in charge of the uh, political security relations, meaning everything in ASEAN that has to do with security, military affairs, defense, law enforcement, peace, uh, that was under my purview. But before that, around uh, six years before that, or rather eight years before that, I also worked with another regional organization, an even bigger organization. It was the Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation. I don't know if some of you have heard of that already. Yes. Yeah. It's, um, it's bigger, it's composed of 21 countries, not only from Asia, but also from uh, the, the Americas, North and South America, and also from Europe, and of course from Northeast Asia, including Japan, Korea, China, even Taiwan as an economy, not as a, cont not a state, but as an economy. And it also includes Hong Kong and uh, others, it, even Papua New Guinea, who's not a member of ASEAN. So uh, uh, that organization is actually the largest economic organization in the Asia Pacific. And it, it actually affects more than half of global trade because it includes also Russia. It includes Russia, China, uh, India is not a part, but Japan is a part of it, and Korea, the United States, Canada, uh, Mexico, Peru, and even Chile. So uh, that was a very dynamic one. And uh, it was also a pioneering one because uh, in, a in uh, APEC, we used to uh, deal with um, uh, pioneering topics. Like as early as 2004, we were discussing things about uh, alien invasive species. I don't know if you have heard about it. Sounds scientific, right? Like science fiction. <laughs> but it's not. Uh, they actually refer to effects of trade. Trade in uh, you know, uh, living organisms. Sometimes as a part of uh, when you trade goods, uh, agricultural goods, animals, some organisms stick to them, which are not supposed to go to other places. I mean, they may be native in one continent, but to bring them to another continent could be disastrous. Uh, we could refer to uh, germs, but actually we could also refer, uh, refer to large animals, like the introduction of Burmese python to the United States. Some of you may have heard of the, of the effect of that. Some Americans bought pythons from Burma to use as pets, but suddenly, uh, during some uh, uh, tornado or typhoon or uh, uh, hurricane in the US, they accidentally got into the wild and then they multiplied. Now, there are so many of them, there are tens of thousands of them in the Everglades uh, National Park in Florida, but that they uh, destroyed the ecosystem of that place. It used to be that a long time ago, crocodiles used to dominate Everglades. Now, it's this Burmese <coughs> python. So, uh, things like that. So. 
these are the effects of regional organizations. They affect our lives, not only politically, but also uh, economically. And they change things, sometimes in ways that we do not expect. But now uh, let me go to uh, my topic, uh, ASEAN. And uh, I'd like you to take, um, um, uh, to pay a good attention to this because ASEAN is a bit unique compared to other regional organizations. Other regional organizations like the European Union are very formal. They're very legalistic and they have been operating like the way diplomats have been operating for the past 200 to 300 years. Very formal and they have to uh, stick to the letter and they have strict protocols. Now, uh, not all of the new regional organizations have been successful. In fact, more than half of them have failed, including the ones in Latin America, Africa, and in other, other parts of the world. I understand that you yourselves have a problem with SARC. Like right now, in the diplomatic world, they say that SARC is already a bit, uh, you know, uh, in a coma, that it has to be revived. But uh, fortunately, it seems that um, although we never expected this and we never had high hopes for ASEAN, it seems to be quite successful uh, recently. So let me start now because I, um, I believe that we don't have so much time. I'll try to cut this as, as short as possible and uh, explain it as simply as possible because I realized that uh, not all of you here are diplomats. Many of you from our different uh, disciplines. This is multidisciplinary. But uh, I guess it's important that you're all here. I think it's more relevant that there are diverse backgrounds here. Because in the future, diplomacy will no longer be the exclusive purview of diplomats. Everyone, actually in modern diplomacy, everyone is now involved. A long time ago, only diplomats go around the world. Now, uh, diplomacy has become uh, so complicated and so sophisticated that we need experts from all fields. From the military, from engineering, from science and technology, from biologists, teach even teachers. We need everyone, everybody. Because knowledge has already so increased that no diplomat can memorize all of them. Like I myself, I used to be, a, when I was in the academy, I used to be a part of the, of the uh, scientific world. I was actually a science scholar in college until I shifted course and took diplomacy. But it served me well because, because of my scientific background, I can go deeper into the expertise of some things that are being dealt with now in diplomacy. So, uh, okay, let me uh, uh, start now. Uh, I was asked to talk about regional organizations and diplomacy in regional organizations, especially in accordance with my experience. Because now, because my experience was ASEAN and APEC, I chose APEC. Now, um, okay, uh, this is different because uh, l let me first uh, distinguish what is regional diplomacy and its difference from bilateral diplomacy. You know, as usual, the normal diplomacy is just between two countries. Like, I'm the ambassador here of the Philippines. I come to Pakistan. I was received by the government of Pakistan as the diplomat of the Philippines to Pakistan. And we take care of the relations between Pakistan and the Philippines, only those two countries. Technically, I'm supposed to uh, mind only Pakistani matters. And your foreign affairs, when it's dealing with me, your foreign affairs office is supposed to talk only to me about the Philippines and what we do to uh, increase our relations, to make our relations thrive. Well, in a sense, uh, we've been pretty successful at that, such that in the past three, uh, four years that I've been here, I'm actually four years now, this very day. Today is 26, right? 27. Oh, I was four years yesterday <laughs> here in Pakistan. I was supposed to stay only for two years, but I'm okay here. I enjoyed it here. Before I came here, they said it's a scary place. <laughs> With war all around, terrorists rampaging in the streets. It's not true. When I came here, it's not true. The CNN is not telling the truth. <laughs> we can live nice, normal, enjoyable lives here. And not only that, I go around. Uh, I go around all over Pakistan. I'm enjoying it. I went to Gilgit, Narankagan. Just say it. I've been there. <laughs> Karachi, Lahore. I've been there. <laughs> so uh, that's the thing. So bilateral diplomacy usually, uh, the normal diplomacy, in fact, it's, I would say, 75% of all diplomacy around the world are bilateral diplomacy, just between two countries. That's why you have ambassadors and you have both countries. Same goes with your ambassador to the Philippines. We take care only of things between Pakistan and the Philippines. So only two countries. Now the difference between that and regional, let me say there are three types, bilateral, regional, and multilateral, the international multilateral. The regional 
only comprises the diplomacy between several countries, usually in a certain area, usually geographic area. So just like ASEAN, a, uh, Association of Southeast Asian Nations. You also have APEC, Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation, 21 countries around the Asia Pacific uh, Ocean. And then, but we also have other kinds of multilateral diplomacy, which are bigger than that, like the United Nations. It's the entire world. Or the World Health Organization, it covers the entire world, but whereas the United Nations covers every topic, all topics, the World Health Organization only concentrates on health topics. The Food and Agriculture Organization, it's also global, it's international, but only one topic, food, sustenance, things like that. Now, um, with regional, uh, we are uh, the midway between bilateral and the international organization. So this is it with it now. The regional organizations are usually defined geographically, just like ASEAN. So how do I define uh, ASEAN? Because this is our main topic now. Uh, diplomacy <coughs> as it is uh, practiced in ASEAN, which is pretty much 90% of the diplomacy here is the same as that of other uh, regional organizations. But I'll show to you the other peculiarities, which makes us uh, really unique. OK, ASEAN, unlike the European Union, is not an economic community, technically. Because when you say economic community, a union, just like the European Union, everything is common among them. The union is so powerful that it controls practically all economic aspects of life in the European Union. So in that aspect, Germany is not independent economically. Greece is not independent economically. Britain, before Brexit, was not independent economically. Whenever they do something economically, they have to do it together. And um, recently, we have seen problems like you have a financial crisis in Greece, and he has to do want, he wants to do something about it. Greece wants to do something about it, but because he's a member of the union, he cannot. He cannot. Uh, Greece cannot just do something about it on its own. It has to get the clearance of the union, of the European Union. Now, what does Greece want? In the past five to six years, it wants to spend more money so it could perk up its economy, but it has a problem. It has financial deficits, it has budget deficits. And if it spends more to address this deficit, it might exacerbate or worsen its deficit. Now the problem is that because it's a member of the European Union, anything that Greece does will affect all the other 27 member, other members of the European Union because there are 28 members. So that's what happens in the Union. You're no longer that, uh, free to do your thing. Uh, the union is able to benefit you economically because you're working together, but you're also affected by each and every other member of the union. So um, that's with them. Uh, they have full union, but we are not like that. Actually, for us, we are only call, uh, call ourselves an intergovernmental organization. We're not even a free trade union yet, a full free trade union. We're not a customs union because when later on we'll go, when we go to the economic side of this, we'll see the different kinds of Regi of regional organizations, the different uh, levels of development. Uh, as far as we, we're just an intergovernmental organization, we're not a federation, we're not even a confederation. So we're just countries cooperating with each other in as many areas as possible. But still, we are free, <coughs> independent countries. We can make our own policy decisions. Or we call ourselves Concert of Nations in South Again, the uh, geographic area is Southeast Asia. By concert of nations, uh, is there a diplomat here? None yet. Oh, it's okay. Le uh, let me explain. Um, a concert of nations is just uh, coming together of certain nations to uh, uh, cooperate on certain issues. The first model of that happened right after the Napoleonic Wars in the 1800s. Right after the Napoleonic Wars, in order to make sure that uh, there will be peace in Europe, the different European countries who went to war during the Napoleonic Wars came together and starting, started discussing security problems among themselves so that these security problems will not worsen and they will not result in a war. And to tell you frankly, it was very successful. Is this working? No, probably not. Yeah. Oh, anyway, it's okay. I guess I'm loud enough, right? Um, but anyway, let me just loosen my tie. <laughs> this is also the ASEAN way, as you will know later. <laughs> In ASEAN, we are not so formal. Actually, uh, we keep protocol to a minimum. So uh, whenever, even our presidents and our prime ministers, when they meet, the first thing they do is, to re is they remove their ties. Yeah. <laughs> the atmosphere is informal and therefore more friendly. 
we are there as friends and you will see later on when I explain uh, why that is okay um, so first of all the ASEAN is an intergovernmental organization or concert of nations in Southeast Asia that's just that nations who come together we have strong obligations towards each other but we're still independent uh, no one can dictate to us even among our members what we need to do or not do especially economically uh, what we have rather are consensus later I'll explain that consensus it's part of the diplomacy there our headquarters is in Jakarta Indonesia and then uh, ASEAN was established by the Bangkok Declaration this is a treaty signed in Bangkok in 1967 August 8 1967 so we just celebrated in the first week of August our anniversary in fact, that's, I think, our 52nd anniversary. So 52 years of existence of ASEAN. Uh, these are what we call the, our founding fathers. This, uh, these guys were the uh, uh, foreign ministers during that time, in 1967, of the Philippines. So five original members. Philippines, Malaysia, Indonesia, Singapore, and Thailand. Five original members. The next slide, please. Um, now, these are the uh, aims and purpose of ASEAN. Okay, you have to pay attention to this because the aims and purpose is exactly the same as 99% of the other regional organizations. Usually, regional organizations are formed to preserve peace and stability and harmony, harmony among the member countries so that there will be no quarrels among them, no wars. And secondly, to promote economic development and progress. So, uh, that those were the aims and purposes of ASEAN as enunciated in the Bangkok Declaration, the uh, treaty that gave birth to ASEAN. So as you see here, this is the evolution of ASEAN. In 1967, there were only five of us. Indonesia, Malaysia, Philippines, Singapore, and Thailand. In 1984, it takes a long time before we add more members. Almost 20 years. Brunei joined us in 1984. In 1995, after 11 years, again, a further 11 years, Vietnam was accepted, 1995. And then in 1997, Laos and Myanmar were accepted. And in 1999, the last member was accepted, Cambodia. Now you will wonder why that kind of periodization. Okay. Um, ASEAN actually was made in the middle of the Cold War. So 1967, you have the East Bloc under the Soviet Union, and you have the uh, uh, we call it the free world in those days uh, under the leadership of the United States. Pakistan and the Philippines were part of that uh, bloc, the anti-communist bloc in those days. So uh, um, at first, well, uh, later on I will explain this further. At first, it was a reaction to the Cold War to make sure that the countries of Southeast Asia will not fall to communism because in 1967, if you will remember, the Vietnam War was raging. And then the fear in those days was that if Vietnam falls, then there will be what they will call the domino effect. Other countries will fall also to communism. Because actually they were, they were trying to uh, 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 get the origin of the domino effect, not in the Vietnam War, but with the Korean War in 1954. Because Korea fell, North Korea fell to the communists, they said, other countries will fall too. And so the, after Korea, the next civil war was in Vietnam. And so they think that if Vietnam falls, then Laos and Cambodia will fall. And then after that, Thailand, the Philippines, Malaysia, down to Indonesia. In 1967, um, Indonesia was just uh, freed from the danger also of communism. Because during the time of Sukarno, the communists were also in power together with Sukarno in Indonesia. In fact, because of that, there was a war between Indonesia and Malaysia. Because there was also a communist revolution in Malaysia, uh, which was supported by Indonesia and the People's Republic of China. Now, uh, the Malaysians defeated them. And, but in the course of that uh, conflict, Malaysia and Indonesia almost came to war. In fact, they started fighting already in the 1960s, early 1960s. So uh, we were all in a bad fix in the 1960s. Even the Philippines was in the middle of a communist revolution. So we thought we we're going to fall to an uh, atheist communist. And you know, the Philippines is a Christian country in the north, and we have also Muslims in the south. 
and the Muslims and the Christians were together fighting against the atheist communist. And so it was a very serious situation during the time. So what? Uh, but in 1990s, the East Bloc fell. The Soviet Union fell. And together with this, most of the communist countries became more relaxed. So uh, Vietnam became less of a communist country. It's still ruled by the Communist Party until now, but it adopted market economy, as we all very well know. And uh, after that, also Laos and Cambodia. And so because of that, because of the end of the Cold War, there was no more Cold War. There's no more reason for us to fight with, uh, with the communist bloc. And because we now have the same system, they also adopted the capitalist system. Although they're socialists, just like China, they adopted the capitalist market system. Uh, there's now more congruence, more similarity between our economic systems and their economic systems. And so they were accepted into ASEAN. So uh, Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia. Myanmar too, although it was never communist, was socialist in those days. So uh, before the end of the Cold War, there, it was very difficult for them to fit in with the uh, free market world because they were socialists. But after that, they reformed. And so uh, they adopted market economy. And so uh, uh, they became more incongruence with ASEAN and the, uh, the rest of the world. Okay. And so now you can see here the map covering all of ASEAN. This is Southeast Asia. So um, at this point, there are new applicants for membership in ASEAN. East Timor. East Timor is somewhere here. This one here. Mm -hmm. This brown, very small spot of brown here. Now they are qualified because they also belong to Southeast Asia. But they've just been independent in the last uh, 20 years, and they're still trying to stabilize that we have not yet accepted uh, their application for membership in ASEAN. And at the same time, we have a moratorium on accepting new members because uh, in the course of the making of ASEAN, we develop so rap rapidly that now we have more than 1,000 smaller organizations under ASEAN handling different aspects, practically all aspects of life, from political, legal, anti-crime, uh, energy, trade, investment, customs procedures, everything. So, um, but because there was this fast proliferation of organizations, it's very difficult for us to uh, manage ASEAN now. It's now a superior bureaucracy. So we, what we are doing right now is streamlining the organizations because many of the organizations duplicated their functions or just on uh, disaster preparedness and disaster response. I guess we have more than seven organizations, different organizations doing exactly the same thing or overlapping in their functions. So it's important that we streamline. So we have this moratorium. Papua New Guinea, this part, is also applying for membership in ASEAN. And technically speaking, they're also in Southeast Asia, so they're qualified to join ASEAN. So uh, these are the pending memberships uh, as of now. So you will see here, that to the south, we are bordered by Australia and New Zealand. To the north, by China and Japan and Korea. Of course, to the east, by uh, India, Bangladesh and India. But that is practically the uh, um, uh, geography of Southeast Asia. And as you will notice, it's primarily maritime. Most of us are island states or coastal. <coughs> the only landlocked state here is Laos. But still, in spite of that, most of these interactions are maritime. Okay, uh, next slide, please. Okay, I'll try to make it as fast as possible. So as I said, it was, ASEAN was born in 1967 with the first ASEAN foreign ministers meeting. When we made ASEAN, there was no ambition whatsoever to do anything more than that. It was just supposed to be a meeting of foreign ministers who come to help each other on certain issues of common concern, whether they are peace or uh, economic issues. So no agenda. Then suddenly, 10 years later, they said, why don't we make it something bigger? Instead of just involving our foreign ministers, why don't we meet our presidents or prime ministers meet? So that decision making could become faster and we could cover more issues than just the foreign ministers. You know, foreign ministers will just be talking about diplomacy primarily and a little economics. With presidents, we can primarily talk about anything and everything. And so in 1976, we had our first summit the first meeting of our presidents and prime ministers. That was the first uh, expansion of power or ambition of ASEAN. During the same meeting too, in Bali, the presidents decided that, okay, we have a loose organization of uh, 
countries loosely cooperating, why don't we have a closer and stronger political cooperation? So they had this called uh, this treaty or agreement called the Bali Concord, which enabled them to uh, uh, have stronger relations, more intensified relations with each other. Now, if you will see between 1976 and 1997, it's almost 21 years. Nothing happened in terms of improvement. But throughout that 20 year period, uh, the cooperation between the different countries become closer and closer and closer. They started to add more and more areas. At first, they just talk about trade, investment, and then defense. The defense was primary to make sure that uh, if we have defense disagreements, we have territorial uh, overlaps or territorial disputes, let's not go to war. Let's just talk about it. And so it happened. 20 years, we were able to do that. Um, OK, let me explain. When ASEAN was made in 1967, just like India and Kashmir, I, India, and Pakistan, we have this uh, dispute on Kashmir. We also had our own disputes. The Philippines had a territorial dispute with Malaysia. The Philippines was claiming the northern part of Malaysia called Sabah. That's right. Uh, the same. It's Sabah is just a little smaller than Kashmir. Now, Indonesia and Malaysia also have their own territorial dispute. In fact, Indonesia would like to take all of them. Can we go back to the previous slide just, to, just for them to see the? Uh, this is Sabah, this northern part of uh, Malaysia. Up to now, the Philippines is a territorial claim there. But it did not destroy our relations because of ASEAN. This is Indonesia. Indonesia is claiming all of that northern part of Malaysia. It's almost half of the territory of Malaysia. So in 1960s up to 1963, Indonesian troops entered this part and they were having wars. But because of ASEAN, we were able to stop that one. And now we're closer than ever. Thailand and Cambodia has a territorial dispute here, uh, especially in the area called the uh, uh, Pravia. They, had, they have been fighting there even until 2011. Then Thailand and Burma, or Myanmar, as we call Burma now, have been enemies for 300 years. Has anyone seen the movie The King and I? No, it's, uh, it shows that one, that for several hundred years, the Empire of Burma and the Empire of Siam have been fighting each other again and again and again for territory here. Mm -hmm. So they were all fighting with each other. Cambodians are fighting the Vietnamese until, 19, uh, until uh, the 1980s and early 90s, especially with when Pol Pot and the Khmer Rouge were in Cambodia. So uh, we have conflicts with each other. Singapore was a part before of Malaysia. It was jacked out. In fact, Lee Kuan Yew does not want to, to leave Malaysia, but the Malaysians don't want him anymore. Because they say that if the Chinese, because the Singaporeans were Chinese, if the Chinese stay in Malaysia, it will dominate the economy of Malaysia. So they remove Singapore from Malaysia. And it, of course, it made the Singaporeans feel very bad about the Malaysians. So see, we were full of conflicts here. So OK, I'll go back, back to the uh, forward slide. But because of the uh, closer, stronger uh, political cooperation, we were able to preserve the peace in the area. So uh, now suddenly, uh, so as I said, for 20 years, we became closer and closer. We had more interaction, more cooperation. Uh, our different cabinet departments, cabinet ministries were all cooperating with each other. The energy ministry of the different countries were helping each other in power generation and power distribution and in transfer of technologies, things like that. The same goes with agriculture. All of them are coming to the Philippines to study how to raise, how to grow rice with the latest technology. Uh, in trade, we were lowering our tariffs. We were removing our uh, non-tariff barriers. Our quotas are being removed. Little by little, little by little, not in one big blow, but always gradually, little by little, for 20 years. Until 1997, they suddenly said, why don't we turn ourselves into a community, just like the European community? And why 1997? Because around 1995, the European Union had it, what, it's, uh, what was called the Maastricht Treaty, which made it a closer union. That gave birth to the European Union as it is now, with common uh, 
economic policy, common financial policy, and one currency, the one currency of the euro. Before, you had different currencies in Europe, Deutsche Mark, Francs, Lira, etc., etc. Now you just have euro, because that's one unified financial policy as a result of a unified economic policy. So uh, because they, uh, everyone was inspired by the closer union in Europe, and the prosperity that was created by this closer union, all the other regional organizations around the world uh, is trying to copy the model of the European Union. The same goes with ASEAN. So in 1997, ASEAN passed European Vision 2020. The idea was to build an ASEAN community by 2020. Okay, next slide, please. But something happened. They said it's too slow. Why do we have to wait for 2020? So in 2007, in Cebu, which is the city of the Philippines, uh, they made another treaty, the Cebu Declaration. We, they say, let's make it faster. Instead 2020, let's make the community by 2015. But that was not only a declaration. When they decided to make it a community, they really worked on it. And by work, meaning realistic work on making a union. It's just a declaration of politicians that after a while will be forgotten. No, it, something has to be done about it. And so in 2008, they said, if we're going to make ourselves into a union, we better have our own constitution. Pakistan has a constitution, the Philippines has a constitution, all countries have a constitution. For us to have to be one ASEAN political economic entity, we should have an ASEAN constitution, a common constitution. So they passed the ASEAN Charter in 2008. That is the constitution of ASEAN. It covers, and it also gave it a legal personality. It gave it an, uh, intergovernmental structures and also procedures, legal procedures. So now, uh, this shows that they are serious. You now have a constitution, you have your own ASEAN government, although it's not yet that strong, but there's there, it's there already. Then by 2011, they said that uh, to make it faster, the community building faster, let's divide the work within ASEAN. You know, it's always easy to say community, 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 but if you're working so many different topics all at once, it's difficult. So to make it serious, let's divide the work. Let's have one group doing all political work, another doing all economic work, another group doing social economic work. And that's what we call the three pillars of ASEAN. The political community, security community, the economic community, and the social cultural community. And each one has their own blueprints or plans to implement to uh, make this community a reality. So, uh, True enough, by December 31, 2015, on the very last day of 2015, ASEAN fulfilled its promise. It was able to launch the ASEAN community. So there now we have an ASEAN community. But no fanfare, no uh, fireworks, nothing. This is only a concert that we did <laughs> during the launching of ASEAN, one of the events that we did. But uh, uh, no fanfare was done about it. It was announced around the world. But the more important part for us was the work that has to be done to make this a reality, not the celebration. So then for us, for others, the launching of the community would be the end point of their jobs. They would say, oh my God, we made the community already, work's over, everyone go home. Not for us. For us, the launching of the community is just the first day of the real full-time work for ASEAN. So uh, because we have to deliver for our people. And so let me now show you uh, what it entails in terms of delivery to our people. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, as I said, this is the ASEAN community. Under this, we have political security pillar, economic, social, cultural. Here, all the departments or ministries of defense are members of this, of all the 10 countries. All the interior ministries are members of this. All the national, uh, all the armies, the police, the intelligence agencies, everyone involved with security are here. This pillar, have, they have a lot of jobs to do. But the overarching thing is that they're in charge of peace, harmony, stability, and peace and order within ASEAN. They're also, they're also in charge of good government, of the laws, the rule of law. So uh, later on, we'll see what this entails. I'll just make it as general as possible so that it will be easy. For the economic community, all the trade ministries, finance ministries, energy ministries, public works ministries, finance ministries, they're all here. And they have... Uh, their work is only encapsulated in the words prosperity, development, and progress. All work concerning those three, three words are being done under this 
uh, pillar of the ASEAN community. Sociocultural community, the cultural ministries, the press ministries, the youth ministries, women's ministries, everything are here. The arts, culture, everything is here. And why is this important? Because if we're going to become a community, we do not only have to maintain peace, we do not only have to promote prosper and prosperity and progress, we also have to have one common identity. We're no longer just Filipinos, Malaysians, Indonesians, we're now ASEAN. So we have to promote a cultural identity. Now, how realistic is this? Very realistic. Because if you look at the culture of Southeast Asia, they're very similar. If you look at a Filipino, a Malaysian, Indonesian, a Thai, we look the same. <laughs> so uh, although we have different names as ethnic groups, we have different languages, we look the same. And the culture is also the same. Uh, a lot of our culture are the same. Now, the thing is that later on, we'll see that there are also a lot of uh, differences. Because we have different religions, we have different languages, we have different ethnic groups. But in spite of that, we have a lot of commonalities that uh, we can work on. In, in fact, just for, for Islam, at least three countries are Muslim there. Brunei, Malaysia, Indonesia. So uh, they can already work together. Then the Filipinos, uh, half, uh, a portion uh, in the southern Philippines is Muslim. So we can, they can work with everyone in the Muslim countries of Southeast Asia. At the same time, the northern part of the Philippines, 80% uh, of the population are Christians, and they're still monotheist. It's the same God, just different uh, way of looking at it, but the same God. So they can work together. The others are, it's more difficult with the others. The others are Buddhist, Confucians, etc. But still, uh, we try to work on what's common among us. So um, there, uh, you, got, you get it. So actually, if you look at the culture of ASEAN, it's just a combination of Chinese culture and South. Because uh, the, the Europeans thought that they're just a mixture between the Indians and the Chinese. <laughs> they forget that they have their own people. But basically, uh, basically, they're looking at some valid truths that the culture of Southeast Asia, as in from being Malay and Southeast Asia, is also a mixture of Indian, or rather South Asian and Chinese culture, or scenic culture. Because actually, if you look at it, it's not just China. It's China, Korea, Japan. The, uh, the origin of the culture is not just Chinese, it's all of them. So uh, and probably if you look at it even further, it was actually an, an Asian culture that started in Siberia and Central Asia, transported to uh, China, Japan, Korea, uh, remodified and then sent down back to us, uh, sent, back, uh, sent down to Southeast Asia and other things. In fact, even Chinese Buddhism, Japanese Buddhism, and uh, uh, Korean Buddhism are not even Chinese, they came from Nepal and India, even from Taxila. So see, it's so uh, we concentrated on those things that uh, are common against uh, among us, and we were able to generate what we call an ASEAN identity, the commonality of ASEAN culture. Okay, uh, next slide, please. Okay, I was talking uh, a moment ago about political security community being uh, the one in charge of peace, order, harmony among the countries. Um, among its uh, major um, missions is to promote peaceful, stable, and resilient region. Now, the most important treaty here, we had a treaty to make that ha happen, and we are following this treaty for the last 50 years. This is the Treaty of Amity and Cooperation, or the Treaty of Friendship and Cooperation among ASEAN. It was signed in 1976. Then we also have a lot of agreements on confidence building measures, preventive diplomacy, and conflict resolution. The idea is that First of all, by uh, uh, interacting among us, we're able to promote confidence in each other, trust. By doing that, we're able to prevent conflict. Uh, yeah, prevent conflict through preventive diplomacy. If the confidence building does not work, we have to have a fallback position, and that's preventive diplomacy. There are also measures for that, usually under the ASEAN Regional Forum. But still, if that fails, then we should have something more, another fallback to take care of that. And that's, uh, those are our own uh, agreements on conflict prevention. Usually this is un done under the ASEAN Regional Forum. And in ASEAN Regional Forum, as we will see later, it is not just compro uh, compri does not just comprise the 10 countries. It, in it includes um, more or less 27 countries in the region, including Pakistan, India, China, 
the United States, and even the European Union. Because we believe that issues of peace sometimes cannot be handled by simply the countries in Southeast Asia. We have to involve other powers who have, or also players in the region, especially China, the United States, Japan, Korea, and now um, not so much with India, it's quite far, but it's still there. And even Pakistan, you're all included there. Everyone who is a player in Southeast Asia, whether in politics or business, are included. So that the consultations would be wide-ranging and more fruitful. And then, to make sure that there will be stable peace in the area, in Southeast Asia, we had uh, this treaty as uh, we turned Southeast Asia into a zone of peace, freedom, and neutrality. And what's important here is the word neutrality. The Chinese, the Russians, and the Americans may fight, but we've committed ourselves to be neutral. So right now, you have a trade war between Ch uh, China and the United States. We are neutral. We are affected, of course, all of us are affected. We are all affected, but we remain neutral. We do not side with one country or another. That's the only way to preserve the peace. Otherwise, whenever the big elephants fight, you will be dragged together with them. It's not your fight, and suddenly you're there, right? That is the lesson of history. All throughout our two thousand, uh, two to three thousand years of recorded history, the it started the Peloponnesian War in uh, Greece. One little uh, state fought with another city state. They dragged Sparta with them, another dragged Athens, and then all of Greece are in war. They have their own mini world war during that time, and all all lost. In the end, they were conquered by the Persians, and then they have to uh, have the revenge. And so Alexander conquered Persia and uh, came to. Pakistan. <laughs> so uh, th that was the lesson. So this is very important for us, neutrality. And remember, we did it in 1971. So during the Cold War, we were able to preserve our peace, in spite of the fact that some of us even have defense agreements with the powers. OK, uh, next uh, slide, please. Now, as I said a moment ago, most of that uh, geography of Southeast Asia is maritime. It's the sea waters. So we have to have maritime cooperation. Safety of shipping, commerce, anti-piracy, search and rescue operation, and in case something happens, just in case, by accident, uh, you're from uh, Air Force, maybe Air Force? Air, Air Rebel Complex. I'm sorry? Air, Air Rebel Complex. OK. You know very well that uh, accidents can happen in the air, no, especially no, no. if two, oh, you're not with the Air Force, right? I know I'm with Air Rebel Complex. It's different if you're from uh, I see, okay, okay. Anyway, uh, but we have yeah, an idea. What happens, yeah, we have an idea, right? Uh, if two fighter planes meet, meet each other at the border of two countries, accident can happen. So, uh, because accidents can happen, we have hotlines to make sure that we're able to prevent that immediately or we're able to arrest the escalation of a conflict, of a possible conflict. So, let's say, let's say, uh, Malaysian. Air Force jet fighter or bomber is trained into Philippine airspace. We don't have to immediately shoot down that Malaysian in the plane. We don't ne necessarily have to lock our missiles onto it. The first thing we do automatically is for someone in our defense ministry to get the red the red phone, call his counterpart in the Malaysian Air Force and say, hey guys, your plane has entered into our territory. And the others uh, say, really? Oh, I'm sorry, it's, a, it's an accident. So there you are. It's, that's a very simple example. But you're already able to avoid conflict. Otherwise, if the Russian plane gets into the Japanese airspace, and the Japanese scrambles, and then they did not understand each other in mid-air, or just like recently, <laughs> the, ja the Japanese plane fired, or uh, rather the, uh, uh, it was the Korean, sorry. The Korean plane fired its missile, right? They already made a warning shot, when in fact it could have been avoided. What if the other plane fights back too, or fires, fires its own missile? Then you have war. It could escalate. And you have two hotheads. Sorry. You have Donald Trump on one side, and another crazy guy on the other side. Oh my god, they have their own little, little computer game. So see? So uh, this is the importance of these hotlines. And we've been using these hotlines for the past 20 years. It was very effective. In fact, uh, it's very effective because we have a conflict in the South China Sea, as many of you may have read. China is claiming all of these. This is China. This is Vietnam. This is the, the West Island of China. 
This is the South China Sea. Look at the claim of China, it goes way down. Too far from their shores. So uh, the Philippines is complaining because we, uh, in our constitution, our laws, and under international law, this part is ours. Vietnam is complaining because under their law, this part is theirs. Malaysia is complaining because under international law, it's, this should be theirs. Brunei is complaining too, and even Indonesia is involved. So there, everyone has conflict with China on South China Sea, on uh, maritime territorial claims. Uh, we sent it to the UN. Actually, the UN already made a decision on that, but China does not want to follow. According to the UN, the claim of China here is invalid because look at the map, it's too far from China. This is 800 miles from China. The maximum you can have under international law is 200 miles or less somewhere here. Us, look at us, our claim is only 200 miles from our shores. The same goes with Malaysia, Indonesia, Vietnam, etc. So, but in spite of that, it's, uh, the, the conflict has been there for more than 20 years. No shooting war ever happened. You have never heard of um, uh, Chinese or Philippine uh, planes firing missiles at each other or ships. The most that happened was for Vietnam and um, Vietnamese ships and Chinese ships to bump into each other. One ship even sunk, but there was no firing at all. No guns, not even a pistol, no missiles, no torpedoes, nothing. So I think because of this, it has been effective in preventing conflict. Otherwise, with five countries here, all mo armed with modern weapons, you, can be, you could have war already in the last 20 years. You could have had war. So managing tensions in the South China Sea. At the same time, we also have assistance and cooperation in case of typhoons. So when, when a typhoon hits the Philippines, everyone in ASEAN helps in uh, the relief and rehabilitation and rescue operations. Then they send goods the emergency goods, because uh, right after the typhoon, it takes the country a very long time to get all the food, water, medicine, all the need, things that it needs. So um, ASEAN already has that ready, even before a typhoon happens. A typhoon hits Vietnam, we do the same thing. A typhoon hits Malaysia, we do exactly the same thing. So response is fast and automatic. And then, okay, next slide, please. How many minutes? Five? <laughs> okay, I'll do it fast. Oh. To preserve that piece, as I said, so we also involve the other countries, not only us, but the other countries in the region. Even Bangladesh, North Korea, Mongolia, everyone. Even the European Union, uh, Australia, China, India, Japan, New Zealand, Ro uh, Korea, South Korea, Russia, USA, Canada. They're all involved in peacemaking in the region. So when there's a problem, everyone discusses it in the ASEAN Regional Forum. The ASEAN Regional Forum meets twice a year at the level of foreign ministers, not just any ambassador or diplomat, foreign ministers. So OK, uh, next slide, please. I, I have any I, I idea anyway. And we also help each other in international crimes. So all 10 countries are there. And in fact, not only the 10 countries, but all the other countries you saw there are also being involved in transnational crime, in fighting transnational crime. And then we are trying to harmonize our laws and we're trying to protect human rights in each other's territories by helping each other together instead of condemning each other on human rights. Okay, next slide. Now this is the other part of the work that's being done, economic community. I don't have to look at this. I don't have to discuss this. Just say that if you take us individually as just one country each, each one of us would be less than 10% of the global economy. But together, we are the fifth largest economy in the world. A combined GDP of 2.9, probably now around $3 million. Now, uh, we also have the third largest market in the world because we have, we have a population of 647 million just below China and India. We're bigger than the European Union. We're definitely bigger than the market of the United States. So just imagine, what can we do? Uh, okay, next slide, please. <laughs> so, um, well, as I said a moment ago, we're not a European Union or Customs Union. We're just some kind of a preferential trading area. Okay, uh, what does it mean? Okay, next. <laughs> I'll, I'll leave this with you so you can uh, look over this. We try to have free flow of goods, services, capital, and labor within the region. Ten countries doing all of this. So what's the effect right now? We now have an ASEAN free trade agreement since 1992. And 
Look at the tariff, 0 to 5%. Actually, don't look at the 5%. Most of them are 0. 99% of the products have a tariff of 0 since 2010. So because of that, we have a brisk, we have a very dynamic trade among us. Okay, uh, next slide, please. And we have FTAs with all our partners, with China, Korea, Japan, India, Australia, New Zealand. So practically the biggest markets around the world, we have an FTA with all of them. So uh, trade increases just like that. In fact, up to now, we have not yet fully um, taken advantage of all the opportunities here. If um, to a range of one is to 10, I guess we've only consumed up to six or seven. So we still have three left in case of uh, access to uh, these markets. Okay, uh, next slide, please. Okay, uh, as I said a moment ago, the social cultural community takes care of culture, ASEAN awareness, identity, and well, literacy rate is more than 90% in all of Southeast Asia because of our cooperation on uh, education. Okay, next slide. Now, um, uh, we have challenges, as I said a moment ago, we have diversity also. We have different politics, we have different economic systems, some are communist countries. Uh, we have different religions, different languages. Uh, and yet, in spite of that, we are able to work together. As I said a moment ago, we had the regional plan conflicts over territorial boundaries. So these were challenges. National sovereignty reigns supreme. And we even have different alliances. The Philippines, is, uh, Philippines uh, Singapore, and Thailand are allied with the United States. Uh, Malaysia is allied with Britain and Brunei. They are allied with Britain. Vietnam is allied with Russia. Cambodia is allied with China. So we have different alignments, if you think of that. So, um, and different economic systems. Uh, some are still Marxist, but they're not market economies. Okay, next slide. But this is what we did. First of all, okay, this answers the question, why are there regional organizations? Why ASEAN? Because we admit that countries cannot solve many of their problems, both domestic and international problems, all by themselves. We have to come together. So. Uh, we call it in uh, international relations the dilemma of common interest and aversion. We also realized that peace will only come if we come together in coalitions. If we divide, there will be rivalry instead, and you'll be fighting each other. Then, and to make this happen, we have to reach out, uh, not only to our friends, but we also have to reach out even to our competitors, rivals, and even former enemies. We have to reach out to them to preserve the peace. And we did it. And then also, as I said, we have a common identity. We have similarities in history, culture, religion, and politics. And so we're working on that. And ASEAN has to be competitive also as a regional organization because there are other regional organizations around the world. They're all uh, doing exactly the same business. And so for us to be competitive, we have to work together. OK, uh, next slide. Um, well, I'm, I'm going to uh, uh, go beyond this. You can just uh, read this. But the point is that in ASEAN, we don't immediately go to the hard political issues. We work on the issues things to work on first. So what are these? First of all, we try to skirt political issues. Let's work first on economic issues, functional issues, trade, investment, energy, things like that. And then when we're okay with that, that's when we go to political issues. But with political issues, we compartmentalize. So you see here, compartmentalization. Uh, we work first on the things that we can agree on. We have territorial disputes, but we can work on law enforcement and transnational crime. Let's work on that. Then the moment trust is built on those areas, then we can work on our disputes. So, uh, and then the lesson of history is that once you cooperated in one area already, the trust that you build enables you to work on other areas. And in ASEAN, it happened. And the cooperation multiplied to other fields. So when you have more areas of cooperation than conflict, chances are, it will be easier for you to resolve your conflicts because the conflict will now just be one small percentage of your relationship. Okay, our next slide, please. Okay, how do we do diplomacy in ASEAN? As I said, the leaders are maybe the prime ministers, so they can give instructions which the foreign ministers will carry out, and then the senior officials, the uh, vice ministers, deputy ministers, and we have working groups. But sometimes the idea for cooperation and uh, innovative ideas uh, comes from the working group levels. So we also allow a bottoms-up approach. They have good ideas, they raise it to the senior officials, they raise it to the foreign ministers and other cabinet ministers, and then our leaders approve them. And so there you are. You have 
uh, new areas of cooperation. That's the where diplomacy happens. So here it happens in all of these areas as political security, economic, social, cultural. Now you have a secretariat. Okay, next slide. Everyone knows the ASEAN Secretary General, but he's not the leader of ASEAN. The Secretary General does not call the shots. The Secretary General makes sure that we're able to, uh, that all meetings are facilitated, that all the deliverables, the projects are implemented. So it's more of a servant of the, of the grouping than its boss. Because the boss, as I, I uh, said uh, in the previous slide, are the leaders and the working groups. So, okay, uh, next slide. Today, uh, the uh, head is uh, Brunei Darussalam, but the uh, leadership rotates. Okay, next slide, please. We also have uh, dialogue partners. It includes Pakistan as a sectoral dialogue partner. The idea is that the dialogue partners are more advanced countries, especially here on this side. Uh, there are more advanced countries which could help ASEAN in their community building activities. Sometimes they even give ODAs to make, uh, uh, to make it happen, to improve uh, ASEAN. But we also have sectoral partners. They don't have to be first world countries, but they are partners that we can work with on specific issues, specific areas. And okay, uh, next slide please. So here, this is the basic document art, um, uh, on uh, the cooperation in ASEAN. We call it the Treaty of Amity and Cooperation, as I said before. There are principles here. Before we can cooperate, we should respect each other's sovereignty and independence. No interference in internal affairs. So um, uh, then uh, secondly, no use of force or threat of force. And third, emphasis on cooperation. Always cooperation, cooperation, cooperation. Okay, next slide. Now, in case something happens, a dispute is brewing. We have a high council which recommends measures for prevention or deterioration of the situation. And then uh, they make sure that there's no threat of force or use of, or use of force. They settle disputes only through friendly negotiations. They uh, recommend the appropriate means of settlement, and sometimes they offer the good offices uh, for conciliation, mediation, or inquiry. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, uh, as I said, there's a rotation of leadership. Uh, decision making is by consultations, uh, and then by consensus. Now, by consensus, it doesn't mean unanimity. It's difficult to have unanimity. But we, uh, we accept the view which is most broadly supported within the group, within the regional organization. It's also good because once there is consensus, then everyone has a stake in it, and everyone will support the decision. In, we don't adopt majority rule, because in a majority rule, the majority wins, but there's always a minority that disagrees. And the ones that disagree are the ones who will sabotage the entire decision-making process, or rather the uh, measures that will be uh, 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 adopted. Okay, uh, next uh, slide, please. I said a moment ago, we stress our commonalities, and then we put the differences in the background. We discuss first issues that everyone is com uh, comfortable with. This one I already uh, mentioned. Separating politics from economics, hard politics from soft politics. And then we do uh, we solve things step by step, slowly. Slowly but surely. That's the uh, idea here. OK, uh, we have already uh, discussed neutrality. OK, next slide. Uh, frequent meetings. Sometimes, even though uh, the agenda are not so urgent, we meet. Because the idea in ASEAN, which is very Asian, quite different from the European one, is that we tend to operate on the personal level, not just on the institutional and legal level. The more we meet, we're able to develop not only networks, networking, but friendship among our, not only among the leaders, but even among the staff, the diplomatic staff. So the moment you're friends, it's now easier for you to resolve some issues because there's a lot of more of give and take among friends than among transactional partners. So, um, so the deepening uh, personal friendship and continued meetings uh, makes the uh, consultations and the uh, uh, consensus uh, easier and faster. Okay, next. Four short diplomacy. Huh? This four, four short diplomacy. Yes, actually. <laughs> oh, wait, which one? A, a sport short diplomacy, yes. This is actually the ones that we use because, as I said, when I, I, I remove the ties or loosen the ties immediately, <laughs> uh, 
The reason, uh, actually, the meaning of that is that there's more informality in protocol. Less legal procedure, uh, avoidance of legalism, because we said, if we are friends, we don't have to discuss this thick enforcement of laws. Let's just discuss it among ourselves. Then, since we are friends and we have goodwill towards each other, then I could, uh, I could give you more consideration on your concerns. You could give me more consideration. And it's easier for us to discuss disputes that way. Because if I have goodwill, you have goodwill, we have trust and then we would like to make each other feel good, then like uh, if you're asking for three loaves of bread and I have uh, three loaves of bread, probably uh, if in other situations, if we're not friends, I cannot even give you one, I'll just give you two because we're friends. So you get the principle, right? It's uh, the very Asian way. So um, most of the things are being done behind the scene through friendly consultations. So okay, uh, next slide. I leave this, so I just go over this later. Um, okay, next slide. Oh, okay, sorry, sorry. So, um, what happens now? After 50 years, what seems to be the verdict? It seems that, according to Kishori Mokubani, um, the ASEAN is the most successful regional organization after the European Union. And he said, it's a geopolitical miracle. And why geopolitical miracle? Because as I've said before, there, were, there are more diversity in Asia or in ASEAN than in Europe. In fact, before they called, they used to call Southeast Asia the Balkans of uh, Asia because we have more differences than Europe. In Europe, you have basically one religion. They're all Christians. You have Catholics, Protestants, Orthodox, but they're all Christians. Here, Muslims, Christians, Buddhists, Hindus, Shinto, Confucian, incredible. <laughs> Different ethnic groups. In uh, Europe, they're all Caucasians. In Southeast Asia, Malays, Chinese, Hindus, everyone's there. So uh, by law of probability, we should be fighting each other already. But the miracle is in the last 50 years, there's been no shooting war in ASEAN. No shooting war. And we also developed the, fast, the fastest. There we have the fastest growing economies. And we, uh, ASEAN was the first to recover from the 1997 financial crisis and the 2008 global recession. So. Uh, now, in an age where uh, the different cultures are supposed to be fighting, there's supposed to be clash of civilizations, we have a lot of uh, crises all over, the, all over the world, ASEAN is able to demonstrate cultural coexistence. So I think we are very modest about this, but I think somehow we are working. Yeah, so thank you very much. Do you still have time for Q&A? <laughs> Maybe I made it longer so that you cannot ask. <laughs> no, it's a joke. You laugh a lot, but our uh, last line is a very good, that you were no war in a 50 years. That's true. That's, that's very good. That's true. Because we're supposed to go to our over territorial yeah. disputes. Yes. And so where you are in ASEAN, right? Okay. You be the <laughs> moderator. Okay, please, please. As the people Yes, yes. That's true, that's true. So the United Nations has called for the inquiry against the fact yeah. that you uh, violated the human rights. So what is your, the Asian uh, comments on this issue? Are they supporting you? Or the They're supporting us. In ASEAN, we don't condemn each other. Rather, we uh, uh, support each other. We understand that there are imperfections. Look at Myanmar. You have also problems with Rohingyas, right? Uh, we also have problems of uh, human rights in other countries. But uh, we take the different approach. I mean, the United Nations is already condemning it, so we take another approach. We help the country which is in trouble to fix itself. And That's the way we do it. So, uh, which country is involved in drug mafia? I'm sorry? And which country is involved in this drug mafia? Uh, you mean the fighting against the drug mafia? Yeah, who are they supporting? Uh, the one supporting us? Yeah, no, okay. no drug mafia. Who oh, the drug the mafia. mafia. Usually the, the same transnational crime from the Chinese triad two of the uh, Latin American drug lords, they're all there. They're all there. In the same way that they're all in our countries. Mm -hmm. you, you also, yeah. You also have a structure within ASEAN about drug crimes. Yes, we have. Yeah, it's under our law uh, uh, justice minister's uh, meeting. We have a law minister's meeting every year, and they're helping in that. And the thing is that it's not only the meeting that's working here. After the meeting, the different agencies are working together 24-7 tracking these uh, drug personalities, hunting them. 
be stopping them. So um, especially along the borders, uh, we have, uh, uh, what do you call that, mutual cooperation agreements within the borders, which are really working, even up to now. For example, uh, certain, uh, certain drugs or personal, drug personalities passed through Malaysia on the way to the Philippines. The moment Malaysia hears about that, they immediately inform us in advance. And while at the same time, the law enforcement is already trying to uh, uh, intercept these people. If they slip away through uh, uh, Indonesia, uh, Malaysian territory, then the next country will intercept them. So that's the way we do it. And uh, they are tried in all of these countries where these drug personalities have offenses. So round of yes. applause for his excellence. <laughs> 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 so we can have more time for a Q&A. <laughs> but but yeah. this, is, this is something which is always... always oh, thank you so you. much. Oh, very fast. <laughs> <laughs> fast. You're here. <laughs> You're all here. Thank you very much. Thank yeah. you so much, excellence. Okay. It's my pleasure. Thank you.